Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Obviously, this is incredibly exciting, and I heard there was a Supreme Court ruling, too. No, but, um, so, uh, thanks for coming. Really, this is, a, this is a great turnout. I'm really, I'm really thrilled that so many people came out to hear what we're going to try to do. We're creating a new organization today called Vermont Lead that's going to work alongside each and every one of you to help make single payer a reality here in Vermont. Uh, I, I just want to say one thing that's actually really exciting to me is um, we've just hired Chris Pearson to help us do our social media. Just give me a raise your hand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can't donate to his campaign here, but I do want to say you know you've all worked with him, and, and I think we've got a pretty good team here at Vermont Leads from our board of directors on down, and we really do want to make single payer healthcare uh, a reality. You know, I think all of us in this room agree that one of the most effective ways we've gotten our message out to date uh, to both the public and to decision makers is by sharing the, the many stories of how the current system is not only failing to help people lead healthy lives, but also nearly bankrupting us in the process. And I really believe that at the end of the day, because we're in Vermont and it's a small place and we all know our neighbors, it's really the commonality of these stories that will help us make single payer healthcare a reality. Most of us have really do have some sort of connection to a person who suffered because of the lack of access to affordable health care. <coughs> Many of us know, for example, a carpenter, a self-employed carpenter who wants to see a doctor but knows he can't because of his high deductible health care plan. Or a low-income person who just can't afford even the $33 a month VHAP premium after they have to pay for rent, gas, child care. And the one that I actually know personally, the mother of a teenage daughter with cancer, who actually wants to work, wants to go back to work, but cannot because she has to spend so much of her, her every day of her life arguing with an insurance company over getting necessary medical care for her daughter. I mean, these are symptoms of a really broken system. And these are stories that we have to spread far and wide if we're going to get single-payer health care across the finish line. So we do want to collect more of these stories here today. Um, in the back with Andrea and Matthew, you can see clipboards. I really do encourage you to just give us a story, not necessarily of yourself, of someone you know who's gone through a really bad situation trying to get um, health care. So I would be remiss if I didn't say something about um, the Supreme Court ruling that just came down. And I, I was talking with Deb Richter about this a few moments before. Yeah. And, and I probably haven't done this enough in, in, in recent past, but I did say, Deb, what should I say? <laughs> and, and she looked at me and, and she said exactly what I've been thinking. Yeah, this is really great. It's really great for the rest of the country in particular, what just went down. But for Vermont, I'm, I'm going to say the same thing I was going to say yesterday when I didn't know about this ruling, which is, microphone. which is the microphone's broken. <laughs> better? No. No? Better? Okay. Which is, no, no still not working? <laughs> right in my mouth? Oh, boy. Yeah. Can you all hear me? No. Yes. Yeah. All right. No. You're in the front row. No, really. <laughs> Really, I'm going to say the same thing now that I was going to say yesterday, which is we are going to go ahead no matter what the Supreme Court decides. Right? <laughs> and if they upheld it, we're still going to fight for single payer because what the ACA is going to do for Vermont is not nearly as good by a long stretch as what single payer health care is going to do for Vermont and Vermonters and help us get affordable health care. So great Supreme Court ruling. We still have a lot of work to do. We are in a forward and we are not going to stop until we have single payer health care in Vermont. And Vermont will be the only state in the country that does it. So, so let me just um, introduce actually someone who's way more appropriate to talk about the benefits in, in single payer health care, and it's Deb Richter. And I, I don't really know how to introduce her because, of course, we all know her. But the only thing I can say, and it doesn't even do with Deb Justice, is dollar for dollar, I guarantee we would not be standing here today talking about implementing Act 48. And getting single payer health care into in Vermont if it wasn't for the energy of Deb Richter. So.
on what we're doing in Vermont and what we've done for so many years. Um, I mean, when you think about it, for more than, I think it's probably 25 years, Vermonters have been fighting for fairness in health care in terms of access and the way we pay for it. Uh, 20 years ago or more, um, VCCH, Bernie Sanders, uh, you guys led a massive campaign, as far as I understand, that was a huge undertaking, grassroots organizing all over the state. The timing, I suppose, wasn't right. Um, you know, you have to have a whole bunch of things on your side, but there were many, many people involved in that. And I think they, again, we have to keep remembering that we're building on top of the work and the energy of people in the past, that people have done in the past. And I, I think, you know, we need to just take heed of these folks, uh, people at VCCH, people in Vermont Healthcare for All, people at VBSR, Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility, um, uh, VPIRG and Vermont Interfaith Action. I know I'm not naming all of these organizations that were responsible, there's many individuals. And I think we all have to remember, we're building on what people have done in the past. I think, and again, we can't forget the Vermont Workers' Center and the work, the massive campaigning they did over the last several years. And all of those things <laughs> involved in this issue 25 years ago were because of the patients I saw in my inner city clinic in Buffalo. And I saw young people dying of preventable illnesses because they couldn't afford, of one was a brother and sister with juvenile diabetes. One of them died at the age of 21 after being on and off insurance, that churning effect, being on Medicaid, off Medicaid, on <coughs> Medicaid, off Medicaid, whenever they tried to work. His sister got pregnant, the baby died I think the baby was born at six months gestation, the baby died a month later, and then the mother died a year after that. One family devastated <coughs> by this ridiculous system or non-system that we have. Some of that will be made better by what happened with the Supreme Court, what happened in Washington, some of that will be made better. But the other example I have is a, a, a gentleman that broke my heart. He was um, probably, I think, 35 years old, was a carpenter and had health insurance, actually fairly good health insurance. He developed testicular cancer. But during the time that he had his health insurance, he had, he had a family who was building up the house of his dreams for this family. And almost had the house built when he was going through his chemotherapy. Now mind you, he had health insurance. And he didn't find it, got his chemotherapy as an outpatient wasn't covered. $15,000 in debt. Well, for a man making his salary, that essentially, and that was years ago, this man went bankrupt and he had health insurance. He tried to get himself back on his feet, lost the house, of course, the house that he built with his own hands for his family, <coughs> and a few years later actually killed himself. So there's a lot of casualties, and I would like to remind you that even with of, call it Obamacare, the ACA, we're gonna still have stories like that. And that's really why we're here. We're here because we need to make it better than what the ACA offers us. And, <laughs> We've heard criticism about Act 48. We've heard that it just doesn't get the job done, it really isn't single payer. Um, you know, why are these people bragging about this? Well, I often look at how much and measure how strong it is that you're what you're doing by how, how much opposition you create. And let's face it, folks, there are people pumping hundreds of thousands of dollars into Vermont to defeat this. So we do have something going on here in Vermont. And I, I would say we should keep in mind the words of Mahatma Gandhi, who said, First they ignore you, Jack. Yeah. Then they ridicule you, Jack. 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 Then they fight you, Jack. 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 And then you win.
around 15 in this very room, there's going to be a press conference of, of, of healthcare activists who are going to comment on the Supreme Court ruling. I encourage any of you to stick around. Please. Pick up the microphone. There will be a press conference at 1.15 in this room with um, some healthcare reform activists who are going to be commenting to the press about um, the, the Supreme Court ruling. So now it's um, my great pleasure to also introduce uh, Will Robinson, who's going to give us some real good tools for how to move forward with communicating to not only people we know, but people we know are undecided about, about single parent health care reform. Will has been a media producer for progressive causes for the last 30 years. His recent projects include last year's Victoria's We Are Ohio, No, no, no One Number Issue Number Two, Campaign Protecting Collective Bargaining Rights in Ohio, which is a victory for every one of us in this country. <laughs> He also ran a successful campaign to protect uh, same-day voter registration in Maine and several winning ballot measures in Oregon, Massachusetts, and uh, Florida. He was also recently named the Political Strategist of the Year for his work in new media by the American Association of Political Consultants. He lives with his wife and family in Maine. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, I apologize. When you come to New York, it's pretty close up here. <laughs> um, so um, what I'm going to talk about is a few things. First, uh, go through some messaging that we've developed already. And after the fights in Wisconsin, we've seen our opponents shift their messaging. And what is really interesting about that is that when they make a shift in messaging, they really make a shift in messaging, where you'll have George Will, Wall Street Journal, Fox News, local conservative radio, local bloggers, walking in lockstep. Mm -hmm. So we have a pretty idea about what is going to be coming at us and what are some of the messages that we've begun to develop. Um, the second thing is I want to talk about some of the social media tools that we've developed. Mm -hmm. And this is really to give you the tools to help organize. Uh, and that we have a, a real good opportunity with Facebook and Twitter um, and some organizing tools, which really we layer on top of the most important organizing we can do, which is face-to-face -face communication and talking to our friends and our families and our colleagues. Um, and then the final thing, which I'm very excited about, is we're going to show you later in the program a couple TV programs, uh, TV commercials that we've produced. Now, uh, we've already mentioned we're going to be collecting stories. And I think that's part of our overall strategy is that healthcare is a very, very personal thing. Every single one of us has had a member of our family or someone that we care about face a, a health crisis. And sometimes those health crises can be devastating to a family financially. And so what we want to do is both collect those stories, but also collect some stories of hope. And we're going to have, a, in one of the spots you'll see, a doctor who's done an excellent job in communicating about that. So uh, the first thing is that there is support for single payer in the state. And that we did an informed question um, in a survey in March, America Works USA, which has single payer at about 58% support, um, especially when you talk about its ability for us to save money. Um, and that cost is really important. And that we talk about, um, if we do nothing even <coughs> with ACA, uh, that the continued rise in health care costs will impact the average Vermont family by $2,500. But by doing this and uh, pushing back on the insurance company's profits, their bureaucracy, um, we can, in Vermont, save hundreds of millions of dollars. But also, it will allow you to deal directly with your doctor and pay any copay you may have before you leave the doctor's office. And then I think which is also good is that this will collect a set of electronic records of your health, health issues. So if you're, you, know, you won't have a situation where you're bouncing back and forth um, that will follow you, um, as, you as you go um, through health care. Um, one of the things we saw in health care fights in other states is that um, one of the groups which is most impacted by the health care costs are small businesses. And that small businesses are absolutely critical to the economy in Vermont. Uh, and a lot of times it is um, a small business person and a member of their family. And they really can't maintain um, having health care because of the crushing costs. 
Uh, and so this will give small businesses the opportunity to have a sense of how much this is going to cost and be able to afford it, not just for themselves, uh, but also for their employees. And all of these pushbacks on costs and also positive things about costs are in the 50s to high 50%. Um, and then finally, um, and in addition to stories, we also want to be able to talk about values. And I think this is an important value that under single payer, it's going to be spending money to make people healthy and keep people healthy and give us the ability to push back on um, the insurance companies, their profits and bureaucracy, and that this will allow costs to go down and allow Vermonters to save money. Now, one of the things that um, I want to talk about is um, the importance of social media. And you all represent a large number of organizations and groups of people who have been very active on this. What has happened over the last few years is that we've seen a dramatic shift of the number of people on Facebook. And that in New England, over half of seniors are now on Facebook. Um, and that this isn't just um, people going on blogs. And in fact, what we've seen is that social media has given us an opportunity to access people who aren't using social media for politics. They're using social media for looking at pictures of their grandchildren. They're looking, posting you know, a picture of their dog in the snow, which was my favorite social media picture of last, last winter. Um, but the important part, if you think about what is the most persuasive communication you have, it's talking to someone that you trust, um, a, work, a coworker, a neighbor, a family member, and they say, what is up with this? And you tell them. Well, what we've seen, and this is from the Pew Center, is that 70% of the news <coughs> that is moved on Facebook, posted on Facebook, is from friends and family. And that in the fights we did in Wisconsin and Ohio and other places, we saw that studies, news clips, and information move from individuals out to their networks. Um, you may be surprised, there are 294,000 people on Facebook over the age of 18 in Vermont. Um, right, I think that we probably could have done a pool on that and nobody would have gotten that. Um, if you include the people under 18, um, it's over 300,000 people. So it really is a very pervasive way of communicating. So what we want to do is we, and I, I checked it this morning. This There's is only 620,000 people. Right. 294,000 people on Facebook. It's getting to the point where it's telephone-like, but you know, every person in the household or many people in the household have Facebook accounts. Right. In fact, if you think about it, um, you know, those some of us grew up in the household where telephone was the main means of communication. Um, and then email. So the 20 year olds who work for me, I ask them to send an email. They're like, oh, come on, well, I'd send emails to old people like my grandparents. <laughs> um, and that Facebook is the way they communicate along with text. But at this point in time, Facebook is a very, very effective way of communicating. Um, we've also seen a couple things. If you post something on Facebook to your friends, um, many of them will see it. If you post a photo, five times more likely that that photo will be forwarded to someone else. And it doesn't always have to be a, a topical photo, but the more personal you make this, the more likely it is to be forwarded. And then a piece of video is 10 times more likely to be forwarded. So what we're going to do is build these tools to help you do the communication. Now, we talked about what uh, messages are going to be, uh, we're going to be talking about. And obviously, you all have done an excellent job in communicating on the issue. Um, and we've also done an excellent job of underscoring the values and the right for people to have health care. But in this portion of the campaign, a lot of this is going to be pushing back on cost. <coughs> and that for us to make the point that this is going to save people money this is going to lower costs for people. Um, it's going to give people the ability to deal directly with their own doctor and pay co-pays before they leave. 
the electronic medical records are going to be helpful in eliminating uh, waste, but also increasing accuracy. And then this idea that dollars will be spent to make people healthy, not for co insurance company profits. But the thing I learned in Ohio was that when we're doing this type of messaging, the one question we need to ask ourselves is, how is this relevant to day-to-day -day people? And how is this going to be relevant in their lives? So if it's a small business person, they're going to want to know, how is this going to help my small business? If it's a young mom, how is this going to help me with the cost for my children? Or more importantly, if my children are covered, how is this going to make sure that I have health care? So in addition to other stories you have and other messages we have, we want to help move these messages about cost. Um, and to help do that, um, we produce some television ads um, of Vermonters talking about cost. Um, but also, we're beginning to collect video. And I know we have people taking still photographs. And we're also going to collect some video today and encourage you to continue to send that in. So as I said, we have almost uh, 300,000 people on Facebook. Um, we have a Facebook page. Uh, Chris is building it. Um, what's the tech? This is a soft launch. Is that what we call it? We're doing a soft launch. So um, I really recommend for you to look at the Facebook page, um, uh, become a fan of the Facebook page, um, send it to your friends. And what's great about social media is that we have the ability through social media to communicate not just with you, but also your friends. And I know many of you are organizational leaders, not just in healthcare, but in the community. So if you post something on your wall, it doesn't reach you, it reaches every single person in that network. So if we're able to put together 5,000 people on a Facebook page, we reach a network of about 90,000 Vermonters. So it's very important for us to start to build that Facebook presence. And this is one of the first things we're going to do. And Chris has done an excellent job already in doing this. And the video and the stories and the photographs we're collecting is going to make this even more valuable. Um, we have a website. Um, it is just being launched today. Um, it has several tools on it, letters to the editor, a place for you to leave your um, information, uh, a place to leave a story, but also it is the beginning of a network of facts and figures and stories for us to use in this fight. So if you have additional information that you want posted, um, send it to Chris, send it to Peter, uh, we'll get it on the Facebook page, we'll get it on the website, and that with both of these tools, this is the beginning of a dialogue for us to have a conversation about this, um, not just with you, but with your, fr your friends and your families and other people. Uh, we have a Twitter feed, uh, we have a couple hundred people who we're following, we're building our Twitter, and what we saw in that chart is that Twitter is good, um, it's a lot of opinion leaders use it, um, it still is the ability for you to move information to your friends. It's also the ability for us to communicate with the press and move other press material. So we want to move in both categories, both on Facebook um, and Twitter. Um, so one of the things we've seen is the, is the importance of moving um, this. Can you move over a little bit? I can't see all of you. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, and I'm sure I've blocked a lot of the screen. <laughs> <laughs> So um, if you see, we call frictionless sharing that um, when you go on a website, you want to be able to say, like, wow, that's a great video. I want to send it to my friends. So if you see the buttons on the top, and this is the spot we'll show in a little bit uh, by Dr. Beach Conger. Um, and it gives the ability for you to share it on Facebook and for you to share it on Twitter. Not think about it, but just send it out, put a comment on it. Um, and then uh, uh, Linda and her partner, um, co-owners of a small business, same thing, ability to share on Facebook, Twitter, and email. And we really want to build those networks. Um, we had, during the We Are Ohio campaign, now this is a bigger state, we had 360,000 people on Facebook in Ohio. Um, and that uh, people started sending in pictures of their family. And I knew that's when we had a campaign that worked, when people start to involve their family in it. And someone had triplets, and they put they're triplets in front of a lawn sign, and they say, vote no on two. It took about 48 seconds. They kind of helped each other. Um, that video got forwarded 116,000 times in Ohio. 
So this is the type of thing we want to do to be able to get our stories out, because stories are very, very powerful things for us to be able to do. Uh, and then, um, so how to help. Um, obviously, you've signed in already. Uh, we'll be getting out additional facts. Let's begin the conversation back and forth. Um, recruit others to the social media pages. And then please send us the stories. Um, we can email them, we can post them on Facebook, um, and let's begin that conversation. I'm very, very excited about this. It's very rarely I get to, to work with people who have already done so much and that are so accomplished. And what I'm trying to do is give you the support to be able to get your message and your story out. Um, and I'll be back in a little bit to show some TV slides. Do you want to take one or two questions, maybe? I'll take one or two questions. And if you want to at this point in time, you can say Danger Will Robinson, because I know that many of you have been sitting there and want to do it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have a good question um, in which uh, we referred to Sanders in a uh, town hall. We had contingent questions that we wanted to move forward on. So I suggested to one of our local politicians, how about using Facebook and develop Woodbury's Facebook? conversation. It didn't work though. How is it that we can, I think technically, that we can work with, have, because I do think following <coughs> the this meeting, how can we continue to talk together? Is Facebook the right method or maybe it's not? Facebook is a method. Um, and then what we've seen in this changing technology is it used to be we go home, we watch television, we watch NBC Thursday night. Now how many people do that anymore? Um, we used to go read newspapers. You know, we still read newspapers, but it's not as pervasive <coughs> as it is. So this is a tool that we can use. And I think if we work at it, it can be a companion to, to the face-to-face -face organizing and the community <coughs> organizing we can do. It's not a panacea, but it is a way for us to give an additional layering of communication. And that as we get information, as attacks come, as responses come, we want to get stories out. It's very, very good to say, you know, I, I had this thing, or is it, you know what, check out the Facebook page. And when the Facebook page and the social media properties have things that are worthwhile, then people make it a habit of checking it and seeing it on there. So, you know, we have been successful. We've been successful, we haven't had this kind of organizational support and this many accomplished organizers together. So I'm really excited about this. Um, in Maine, where we used it for the legislative fight, we had 35,000 people on Facebook. In New Hampshire, where we used it for legislative fights and for organizing across a group of organizations, we have 27,000 people on Facebook. So I think we can, I'm not putting a number, but I think we can, we can start to move that fight and that network helps you build others. I know that we're, we're one more question. And then we'll be around after. Yeah. Also, we're going to make sure Will's um, presentation is available electronically. I'll be able to get that out to you. He told me he finished it one in the morning. So you know it had all his Yes, it's, it's still fresh. <laughs> <laughs> Another question? Okay, well, I'll be around. I'm going to show the spots. Um, uh, I don't want to hit the emotional high point of the day just yet, so we'll wait for the spots. Um, and then I'll be around afterwards. But thank you very, very much for the opportunity to speak in front of you. And I'm really excited about working. So, before I introduce our next speaker, I, I do feel like there's one person I want to recognize who, who came in a little late. And a lot of us in this room ask for things all the time, and we yell and we badger her, but I don't think we're going to get the single pair health care in Vermont without her. Her name's Robin, and I'm going to bear it too a little bit, but I got to say, Robin, I'm so happy you came. You know, And we're not asking you to do anything for us. We're not going to ask you for information or anything. You just listen. No, but, um, great. Um, our next speaker is someone who's obviously a very important, very important in what we're trying to do here. Her name is uh, Veronica Turner Biggs, and she's the executive vice president of 1199 United Healthcare Workers East. Um, thank you. Again, my name is Veronica Turner. We're going to drop the bigs. Um, my name is Veronica Turner, and I'm the Executive Vice President for 1199 SEIU, and I'm responsible for our Massachusetts region. I, I have a 
kind of talking points here. I'm going to put those aside because you all are the experts in the room, and I don't need to tell you how important it is to get single payer passed. Um, what I do want to say is that um, 1199, as the largest healthcare union in SEIU, is pleased to offer our support and our help in ensuring that Vermont, you know, reaches that finish line, meets the goal of getting single payer passed, leading the way, as you have. Uh, in so many other different respects. Um, and that's really what I want to say. The experts are here. We got Will on messaging. You got Dr. Uh, what's your name? You did a you did a really good good job. I just met uh, Peg from the Worker Center. Uh, those are the experts in the room, and we're really here to offer our assistance. And I'm very honored to be here to help in any way we possibly can. Thank you. So, while, um, before we, before the governor arrives, I think we're going to show examples of the kind of messaging and communications we're working toward. Um, we're going to show the two TV ads we produced, and I'd be very interested in anybody's feedback on, on, on what, on these TV ads. I was cursed as a member of the AV club in high school. <laughs> so I'm praying to God this works, okay? We'll try it once with this, then we can MacGyver something if that doesn't work. You can see we need to address our rest of this part. So uh, there's two spots. The first is um, a family doctor, uh, Dr. Beach Conner, who um, has really been a very forceful advocate uh, and talks about the cost of this. Uh, and uh, we shot this in his office. Um, I think he's a terrific doctor um, and a very powerful spokesperson. And I hope we can get many, many other people telling the same type of story.
secondly, we've also um, have a nurse that is going to be talking about the cost of health care and that we're working on other small business people. So if you have a story or people that we want to get, as I said, we're kind of in this new world now where um, you can move video and move messages not just on television. Um, and that uh, you know, a piece of video being moved through a network can really be seen by uh, tens and thousands of people. Yes, ma'am. I think it'd be great to have this on the website, too, though, because there are definitely people who will never <coughs> use Facebook. Yep, this, this is on the website. Um, yeah. We just put it on this morning. Um, and we also have a YouTube page that will also be on. Yeah. No, and you know, how many people read the book Moneyball? Did anybody read that? Um, it's, it's a story about a baseball team that had a limited budget and they lost their big players. And so what they said was we had to put together less expensive, less good players and get the same stats. And that's basically what we're doing right now with new media. Our big player's not there anymore. Television isn't getting the ratings. We don't watch television the way we used to. But between Netflix and Hulu and YouTube and video and Facebook, and now more and more with mobile devices, we're able to put together that other set of media that we can do. Um, and it's not just the 20 year olds anymore. But depending upon your age and depending upon your experience, your experience with media changes. So that's why we're going to be doing television and cable, some online, some radio, but really trying to use social media as a way to build something and the website that will be there for us in the long run. We, and I'm a media consultant. We do a TV ad, that's terrific. At the end of the TV ad, there's nothing left. We build a social media group at the end of a campaign, we may have tens of thousands of people who've been united for a cause, working for what's right, working to help people, and we then have that group that we're able to use for other things. So I think that social media is the media for organizing, um, and I, I think it's a really valuable tool, but you know, Chris, I, Peter, the whole team are willing to work with you um, if you don't if you're not used to being on it. My mom is 187 years old. Um, and she's like, she wants to get on because she wanted to see what I was doing and she wanted to see pictures of my granddaughter and then my daughter. And then um, about six weeks later, I get an inv invitation from her from Farmville. Um, and then, you know, Mafia Wars, like my mother's playing Mafia Wars on Facebook. Um, and she's joined 30, 73 different groups. Um, but I think that's the type of thing. But if you are, you know, like a lot of other people, like, I don't want to be bothered with it, that's fine. This is Moneyball. So we're going to find other ways to communicate with you on that. But, you know, we understand technology aside, Still, the most effective way of communication we can do is a friend talking to a friend about this. We are not going to have the resources the other side has, but we have something much more valuable than that, and that's people. Um, and that's why we really hope to have this type of organizing work to support you and your endeavors on this. Not, not surprised the governor is running a few minutes late, and I'm reluctant to start Wendell's presentation only to have it interrupted by the governor, so we can just take a minute, take a breath. But I do want to say to folks that we have a lot of swag back there you all can pick up. In particular, there's a lit piece that Deb Richter and Ellen Oxfeld worked very hard on with alongside of me. And if you just want to take a single copy, and I'm happy to get you more copies um, that you can use uh, to hand out wherever you go. So. You know, I can't tell you how excited I am to see the energy in this room, to see the people that have waited so long, worked so hard, to get us to the point where we have got. And all I can say is, we are just warming up. That's our message. Vermont is going to be the first state in the country to be a place where health care is a right and not a privilege, where it follows the individual, isn't required by the employer, and where no one goes to sleep at night, knowing that if they wake up not feeling well, 160,000 Vermonters go to sleep every night knowing that if they wake up not feeling well and they are really sick, they lose all of their financial security. Mm -hmm. 
The other 40,000 who wake up every single day knowing that if they get sick, they can't pay the bill. And to all the health care providers who work in a system that asks them to work hard for too little, to be controlled by insurance companies instead of by the medical professionals that train them. This will be the stay where they can practice medicine once again. And keep it and I'm so grateful to Veronica and to Wendell and to all the people that you're presenting today. And I just want to keep this message short. Listen. The industry, the insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, the medical parts makers, the folks that are making so much money off the most expensive healthcare system in the world, all know that they really, in their hearts, don't think much about the little state of Vermont. They don't. But their fear is that if they can spread enough misinformation, if they can spend enough money telling untruths about the truth, that maybe they can keep the pony from getting out of the shed in Vermont, not because they're worried about the pony, but they're afraid of the stallion getting out of the barn in California, and New York, and Texas, and Arizona. <laughs> and our job is to tell the truth, to give Vermonters hope, to do it right, and to get the pony out of the shed. That's our job together. So when you look at what we're doing here, designing a system where healthcare providers can thrive, designing a healthcare system where individuals stay healthy, ensuring that we stop this madness, where we spend money at a rate that can't be sustained, that cripples job growth, that cripples economic development, that doesn't allow small business to invest in innovation and more employees and the kind of investments that business have to make because the healthcare dollar is gobbling up every single dollar that they're able to expend. If we can show them right the path in Vermont to the sensible systems that everybody that we compete with for jobs and the rest of the world figured out long before we got there, America thrives, Vermont thrives, and we're able to have a bright future for our kids and our grandkids. It's that simple. So this is not only about human rights. It's not only about doing it right. It's about our economic future. It's about jobs and economic development and a bright future for future generations of Green Mountain Vermonters. Now, what is it about the industry that thinks that they can convince smart Vermonters that government is taking over? that your freedom is going to be taken away. That if you do the right thing, all the wrong things will happen. And what I say to the industry is, listen, the reason that this message, that this work, that the grassroots, that the, what we're doing here today is so important, is that we're going to need to harness every resource we can to ensure that Vermonters have the information that they need to support this extraordinary opportunity for their economic future. That's our message together. Together we'll get it done. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. So the governor has time for one or two questions. Does anyone have a question? Really, anyone have one or a question for the governor? We have time for one or two. priority, and I can assure you that nothing will make me waver from my <coughs> commitment to develop, to deliver on single-payer health care for Vermont as quickly as I know how. Thank you. And by the way, I, I've been amused. I don't get amused that easily these days. I'm too tired. But I've been amused by some of the stuff I see in the blogs uh, going on where they say, you know, if someone does this, 
that will allow someone to compromise on that. Listen, uh, you're picking the wrong horse if you think that I'm going to be the leader that settles for half a loaf. The challenge for healthcare in Vermont so far, and for healthcare reform in America so far, is that no one has been willing to have the courage to do the right thing. Incremental reform will not work. We've learned that time and time again. And I will not be led down the path of least resistance. Hey, on that note, thank you so much. I just, as I look around this room, I see the folks have been working so hard for so long, toiling in the fields, getting us to the point where we are. You've done extraordinary work, but it's really important to remember we got a lot more work to do. Stick with it. Your enthusiasm, the grassroots is what matters. That's gotten us where we are so far. Keep knocking. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, Wendell. If anyone can follow the governor of Vermont, it's Wendell Potter, I think. So, I have to give a little personal thing here. Uh, back in 2009, I remember turning on the TV and seeing Wendell Potter's testimony before Congress, whistleblowing about what, what was happening in insurance companies. And if you had told me back in 2009 that I would actually be introducing him one day, I thought I would have never believed you. So this is actually kind of a thrill for me. So, brief bio, Wendell, following a 20-year career as a corporate public relations executive, he left his position as head of communications for Cigna to advocate for meaningful health care reform and to help socially responsible organizations achieve their goals. In a widely covered 2009 congressional hearing, Wendell disclosed how insurance companies, as part of their efforts to boost profits, have engaged in practices that have resulted in millions of Americans being forced into the ranks of the uninsured and how they've used deceptive PR tactics to defeat reform initiatives. Wendell currently serves as senior analyst at the Center for Public Integrity and is a contributing writer to the Huffington Post. So, my great pleasure, hand it over to Wendell. Thank you. Thank you very much, you all very kind, and I really appreciate the chance to be here. I, uh, uh, I am so honored to be a part of, of what you all are doing, to play a small, small part of it. Um, how many of you here are committed to universal health care in the state of Vermont? How many of you are truly committed to single payer? How many of you are committed to not doing stupid things? <laughs> and to try to make sure you're going forward and doing, achieving what you're setting out to achieve. I mention that because uh, I, I, I try to keep up with what's going on here. And as, the, as the governor said, uh, uh, there are some things in the blogs and sometimes in the media that uh, uh, that, that can be interpreted in certain ways, and I, uh, I, I, I've, I've come across a couple of those in recent days. You probably have too. How many of you have heard, have heard the expression, uh, united we stand, divided we fall? Yeah. <laughs> Go to the tattoo parlor soon, get that tattoo right here. <laughs> because it's so important, there are many of you who are fighting this good fight, have been for a long time. Your friends, your allies, you're part of different organizations, some of you, but you're fighting for the right thing. And just keep that in mind. And there will be times when, when you will probably have some disagreements. Uh, but please don't air your dirty laundry in public. It's really important that you don't do that. Uh, I was reminded uh, as I was reading a, an article in a blog post recently, that, uh, or a couple of articles, about uh, uh, the movie Sicko and what we in the health insurance industry, when I was still in the industry, what we were trying to do to anticipate what the movie Sicko was going to be about and then how we would try to uh, discredit Michael Moore in that movie. And one of the things that we did from the very beginning, when we first heard that Michael Moore was going to be doing this movie, uh, this was at least a couple of years before the film actually screened, was to make sure that we uh, scoured the media for any mentions of, of, uh, of, of Michael Moore's uh, movie uh, but we, that, that we also were careful as we communicated to each other about it and what our plans were. And I wrote about this in my book, Sicko, excuse me, about the movie Sicko in my book, Deadly Spin. 
Uh, we worked uh, very closely with our trade association, America's Health Insurance Plan, to develop a strategy to try to uh, make sure, if, if best we could, that Sicko had minimal impact on, uh, on Americans and on the political process, because we knew that health care reform was going to be debated by Congress soon after the next president was elected. Sicko premiered about five years ago, it was five years ago this month, and uh, in a few days I will be actually on stage with Michael Moore in Philadelphia for a reunion uh, of uh, those who appeared in the movie Sicko, so I'm uh, looking forward to that. And to uh, seeing him for the first time as a, an advocate for health care reform, and I met him before, he didn't even know who I was, but I was actually spying on behalf of the industry. Uh, the thing that I wrote, I'm just going to read a couple paragraphs here. AHIP, American Health Insurance Plans, and every PR person in the health insurance industry had been trying to get information about Moore's intentions since July 2004, when he had mentioned to a reporter that his next film would be about the U.S. health care system. Most of us had feared it was just a matter of time before he and his film crew began showing up at our corporate headquarters demanding to talk to our CEOs, or worse, waiting at their homes. In anticipation of those tactics, which he had used in most of his other films, I met with corporate security to develop a plan to make sure that managers at every Cigna office knew what to do in the event that more showed up at their doorsteps. I, was all, I also scheduled media training sessions with all the company's top executives, equipping them with pithy things to say and pointers on how not to look like a deer caught in the headlights if they got ambushed leaving their home or getting out of their limo. Above all, we in the industry strove to keep our activities and plans close to the vest. Fearful that an internal memo or email might be leaked to the media or wind up in Moore's hands, AHIP advised all of its member companies not to even put Moore's name or anything remotely related to his project in writing. AHIP didn't want insurance companies to appear to be on the defensive. In December 2004, it was disclosed that at least six drug companies had been warning their employees in internal emails to keep an eye out for more. <coughs> when one of the emails was leaked, Moore went straight to the media with it, knowing that the drug companies had unwittingly given him exactly what he needed to generate early interest in his movie. Determined to avoid the same scenario, insurers were giving their employees the same instructions, but not in writing. AHIP was so cautious that its staff, uh, that its staff was instructed to use the, the code term Hollywood in communications to company executives about Moore and his movie. We were buttoned up. Not one time in three years did we send an email within the whole entire insurance industry about Michael Moore or gave any indication that we were concerned about that movie or what we were doing to plan our attack, our strategy against Sicko. So keep that in mind. The other side is very much developing a strategy for how to defeat you. Don't give them any ammunition. Do the right thing. Stick together because you really need to stick together to make sure that this works. <laughs> How many of you have heard of the uh, uh, the Art of War? It was written about 2,500 years ago, probably longer, by a Chinese general uh, named uh, uh, Sun Tzu. I'm probably not correctly uh, pronouncing it correctly, Ellen, but that's about the best that I can do. Uh, uh, he wrote, uh, among other things, this, which I think is very important for, for what y'all are trying to do. Strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. And that's relevant to what I was just saying. Uh, don't do anything that is noise, that distracts from what you're doing. And all of you, I hope, will be able to come together and work, develop a strategy, and make sure that whatever you do is part of that strategy, and that you're not undermining your efforts. So you're not shooting yourself not only in the foot, but in the heart. So that's my admonition there. Uh, so I'm, I'm suggesting some things not to do, but now let's shift and talk about some things that I think, that I hope you will do. And that is to communicate uh, not only appropriately, but effectively. And uh, Peter, did we uh, hand this out yet? Uh, yeah, it's on the back table. Okay. What you will see as you go out, if you don't have it already, are, uh, is a sheet of paper with a, the heading, Key Messaging Takeaways, Using Proven Methods to Improve Message Effectiveness. And I've got about four different areas here that I'm going to go over briefly. 
because I think that if you incorporate this into the way you think about communicating what you're trying to do, you'll be much more effective in communicating to everybody in this state that needs to be persuaded that what you're doing is the right thing. Uh, the first one is stories are the most effective vehicles for con conveying a perspective, which is exactly what we heard just a few minutes ago. It is so very important. This morning after the Supreme Court's decision was announced, I was on this, what's called the SCOTUS blog, which is the, the, the blog of the Supreme Court, uh, because that was where we were, those of us who were following this most closely, were finding out, well, what really is the Supreme Court going to do on this? And I, as I was thinking about that, I knew that, that my life would be affected, your life would be affected, but I thought uh, about a man that I met in Denver, Colorado, on March the 23rd of last year. That was the one-year anniversary of the signing of the Affordable Care Act. This gentleman came up to me after I spoke. Uh, I was speaking, I was invited to speak there about the law and about how it was already benefiting Americans. And he came up to me and he said, I am one of those people you were just talking about. He said, I know that I would not be here today if it had not been for the Affordable Care Act. I have not been, I'm, I've been very, very, very sick. Because of that, I have not been able to get health care. I've not been able to get insurance uh, because I've been considered uninsurable by the insurance industry. They will not sell me coverage. Because of the Affordable Care Act, for the first time, though, I've been able to get coverage through a high-risk pool. The, federal, the, the Affordable Care Act provided some additional money for states to expand their high-risk pool or to start one. And he was telling me that he knew that he was still walking among the living as a result of that law. I thought of that as I was writing my, my I had to write a, 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 a brief story about the Affordable Care Act before I came over here. And I thought of that and I told that story. And as I, as I did this, because this is what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, try to make it personal. Try to explain how, how the affordable, how single payer, what you're all trying to do, will affect real people. Uh, people can only retain seven specific facts in short-term memory. Remember that you're competing with many other facets in their lives. So your facts often have very little room to take hold. That's why stories are so important. If you can tell a story, people remember a good story for a lifetime. I will never forget that man's story. And, I, and I'm able to repeat it. I, I've forgotten his name, but I'll never forget his story. Uh, and people find value in sharing good stories. Uh, and as we heard earlier, this is how an idea can go viral. You can, you can tell these stories, you can get them on, you, can, you can use social media and, and just keep repeating it yourself. And they will go, they will, they will seep into the population. Think of your target audiences or your target audience as your customer and serve them. Rather than convincing people that you're right, that you know what is best for them, share your perspective with them as a, as a service to their lives. Don't preach to them. Don't tell them necessarily that it's your way or the highway, that you know what's best for them, but to share your perspective. Focus on the what's called the WIFN factor, what's in it for me. Remember that a lot of folks say, we, we do a lot of, we, we give lip service to caring about other people, don't we, often. Now those of you here do more than that, but many of us just give lip service to it. We say we care about those poor folks who are not insured, uh, or as I have written about those folks who had to stand in long lines to get care of animal stalls and barns near where I grew up. But when you get right down to it, we really are most interested about how something will affect us and maybe our family. So WIFM is what's in it for me. Speak in benefit-focused language instead of policy-focused language. Here's how single-payer will benefit you rather than here's why single-payer is good for America. Make it personal. Avoid speaking down to your audience and, and don't presume that your values are shared. And I'm going to venture into a little area of, of uh, maybe com some controversy here. Uh, for some people, uh, so they, they, they really do believe that health care is a right. It's a human right. I will tell you folks that as I have been doing what I'm doing, I have encountered many, many people who don't buy that, who have to be persuaded this is the right thing using other language. Uh, it's, it could be used with some audiences, but not necessarily everyone. So determine who you're talking to, how best to communicate with them. 
and, and how, and, and again, not presume that your values are shared by everybody. Engage in asking questions. Be interactive. Be engaging. Act, you know, as you're communicating, make it interactive. But have a conversation with people rather than talking to people. Listen. Hear people. Know what they're saying, what they're, where they're coming from. If you can do that, you can, you can usually be in a much better position to persuade people to think and to, to, to believe, as you do, that single peer is the way to go. Uh, provide good customer service. My wife uh, has been in uh, customer service for a long time. She used to work for a congressman. She was a, a legislative assistant, and she also dealt with constituents. Now she's in, uh, she works for a retail store. Uh, she, ha she wouldn't have her job if she didn't, from day one, know the importance of customer service and, and looking out or thinking of her customers first. And that's what you need to do with your audience. Think of their needs first. Uh, focus on the why instead of the what. And this is so very important. Don't just talk about the how of, help of single payer or what it is, but why it's relevant to them. Why, why it's important. Why? Get back to the why of single payer, why the state is proceeding along this course in the first place, why it's important to every single person in this state. Being relevant to people's lives and values is crucial for buying. Most people have only a little time and resources to spend on policy and governance issues. That, folks, is frankly why we've seen uh, so much confusion about the Affordable Care Act. Those who have been supporters of the Affordable Care Act have, have attempted to try to explain uh, the benefits in intellectual ways. It's a very complex bill, but they've not made a lot of progress in getting people to really connect with that, uh, that, that law in, on an emotional level, that they can really understand it. So that's why it's been so easy for the other side to say that it's a government takeover of healthcare or that it's socialized medicine. They will do the same thing to you, certainly, uh, as you go forward. Respect people's times and get right to the why, the why they should care. Uh, and why they should support what you're doing. And uh, again, uh, uh, this, uh, avoid gory details around statistics, measurements, and the trials and tribulations. You can, you can work in uh, uh, statistics, you can work in important data points uh, as you're talking to someone, but do it in, uh, wrapped uh, inside story. Do it in a way that uh, you're just not uh, hitting them overhead with stats. One of the things I've observed since I've been on this side talking to uh, advocacy organizations, and I would say maybe uh, progressives in general, is I've found that progressives seem to think if you just lay out the facts, yeah. that people are going to line up <laughs> behind them and, and just uh, realize, well, those, those, that's right. And so I'll, I'll, I'll support single payer. It doesn't happen that way. It doesn't happen. The other side knows that. That's why the term government takeover was developed in the first place. It's, it's, a, it's a phrase that's packed with emotion. It connects with people emotionally. It scares the heck out of them. Uh, but it don't, you don't need to do any fear mongering necessarily yourself, but you could but just know that, that they understand, that they uh, don't try to condemn the Affordable Care Act by uh, laying out lots of facts and figures. They do it by trying to connect with you emotionally, and they've been very, very successful. Use known symbols to engage the mind. Uh, phrases, idioms, metaphors, and conventional wisdom all contain cultural symbols that people have already invested in and accept and trust. Your ability to link your policy advocacy to known trusted symbols provide you with a direct path into trust. <coughs> what I'm saying here is to use language that language that people can relate to. Uh, don't try to, to be such a policy wonk as you are, 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 are talking to people about what single payer is all about and why it's so important. Use of known and accepted symbols provide comfort, familiarity, and engagement. Instead of fact-based state healthcare exchanges, for example, a symbolic alternative would be, it'll be like shopping for books on Amazon.com with different options, prices, and reviews all at your fingertips. You see what, what, I, what I did just there? Uh, when you talk about healthcare exchanges, people don't know what the heck you're talking about unless you can relate it to something that they are familiar with, like Amazon.com. I'm going to leave it at that. I hope that this has been somewhat helpful uh, about how you can communicate. I'm hoping to spend more time uh, working with, uh, uh, with those of you who are advocating <coughs> for single-payer in the months and, and, and years to come. Uh, 
And if there's time for any questions, I'd certainly be receptive to <coughs> answering anything, you, any questions you might have. Well, it's true. Actually, it was one of the areas of the movie I was a bit concerned about because uh, uh, it opened him up for a lot of criticism. A lot of people just think that he should never have done that and uh, to give the, the Castro government any any uh, good press in the U.S. But but it's you know uh, the, the people do have access to good care uh, in in Cuba more than a lot of U.S. citizens do. It's very true. Well, no, I'm curious from your experience in the corporate world. I mean, a lot of us are proud of Vermont. Being at the leadership uh, and taking such a leadership role, how high up the food chain of, of the industry is our little effort going? I mean, are, are people watching news clips? I mean, how, how worried are they about what we're trying? They're to very worried, and it is at the very, very top. Every CEO is paying attention. Like I said, what we were trying to do for and anticipating Sicko, uh, I think if we spent that much time uh, anticipating a movie. <laughs> Just imagine what they're doing with what's going on here. You may think that, uh, that people aren't paying a lot of attention, and maybe the rest of the country in general is not too, too much aware. You can rest assured that the folks in the insurance industry are getting every, everything that, every email that they can get their hands on, every news article that they can get their hands on to try to assess where the weaknesses are and how to attack what you're doing. It is at the pinnacle of what they're, they, they don't want any state to succeed. Uh, the big for-profit insurers don't have a big presence here. Uh, the company I work for has a, has, a, has a presence here. But even though most of them don't, they don't want any state to, to achieve what you're trying to achieve. So as Deb said, they'll be throwing a lot of money uh, to try to uh, derail this, and they will always be watching everything you all do, looking for opportunities to divide you, uh, and to get this off track. It is top priority for those guys. for years and years about how awful <coughs> government is and have been led to uh, uh, not appreciate and, and often to fear government bureaucracy or growth in government. And, and that has been done by the corporate interest because they want to obscure the reality of the worst bureaucracy that we all have to deal with if we have private insurance. Uh, their death panels do not exist in the Medicare program. Obamacare does not create them. But you can rest assured that death panels do indeed exist inside the corporate bureaucracies of big insurance companies. So if you can begin to tell stories about how people you know are victims of this awful system we have because we have allowed, while we were not paying attention, we allowed for-profit corporations to take control of our health care system. That is why we have 50 million Americans who don't have insurance, and that is why many people who do have insurance can't get the coverage, can't get the care they need, because some bureaucrat somewhere inside some skyscraper, like the one I used to work in, is making decisions that will possibly cost you your life or someone's life that you love. So try to make sure that they understand Bureaucracy, corporate bureaucracy, is something that is real, and people just don't know very much about it. But it can be far, far worse than the government uh, getting, you know, more and more involved in healthcare. Does the pharmaceutical companies behind the scenes working with the insurance industry? The pharmaceutical industry, yes. Uh, the, the insurers and the pharmaceutical companies have worked very closely together along with medical device manufacturers and even uh, physician groups and hospital companies. Uh, they like the status quo. They profit from the status quo. So the things that you're doing here, 
can have uh, a negative effect on their bottom line. So know that they are paying attention as well, too. When you are attempting significant change like you're doing here, far-reaching change, uh, when, when there is a public policy uh, that is going to be in some way affecting some corporation's uh, profits or some individual's uh, income, you can rest assured they're going to try to fight it. And that includes the pharmaceutical companies and the others. Uh, they want to protect their turf. They want to protect their ability to keep earning the same amount of money that they have. So, Hospitals, uh, you know, you shouldn't uh, not necessarily uh, have a blanket indictment of every uh, every every part of the healthcare system, uh, but for-profit health, for-profit hospitals. I don't think you have them here necessarily, uh, but uh, uh, they too want to protect their interests. But every entity in the healthcare system is nervous about change and how it will affect them. So they will always have their own strategies to try to uh, to make sure that their interests are protected. Well, it's hard to hard to hard to, to, to find. They they work really hard to make sure their fingerprints are not on a lot of the efforts to to de derail what you're doing or divide you. Um, uh, but you can see a lot of the evidence of what they're doing through the ads that you're hearing on the radio and seeing. Uh, some of the commentary that's made by those who are opposed to what you're doing. You'll see some things showing up in political commentary and speeches that politicians are making who are not supporting what you're doing. Uh, know that often uh, politicians are using talking points that are provided by people like me, like I used to be. That's exactly where they come from. They're getting money, not just money, but they're getting advice. They're getting uh, talking points from the industry. Uh, it's, it's almost impossible to trace Trace that back to the industry, but know that's exactly how it happens. Yeah, please. And in the media, too, not just politicians, but their friends in the media. How does the industry manipulate people? Uh, I was interviewed, there was a, a, a this, uh, yesterday on CNN.com, there was an interview with me, and I talked about how they, in particular, how the industry has worked to get people of faith to vote against their own best interests. I've been going all over the country talking to <coughs> churches that will allow me to come and talk to them. Uh, a lot of uh, pastors are afraid to <coughs> come in because they know that there are some people in the congregation who uh, might not agree with what I have to say <coughs> or might not want to hear. Uh, I don't deal in opinions. I talk about facts and I'm talking. But uh, to get back to your question, uh, they know that they can uh, co-op people. They can get people to uh, uh, go along with their agenda if they can persuade people that uh, uh, if they vote a, if they vote for a candidate who, for example, uh, uh, is against abortion or gay marriage, uh, they fund they 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 help finance campaigns of people who will are, are those kinds of candidates because they can be counted on to vote the way the insurance companies want them to vote. That's how they get stuff done. The insurance industry knows that it's, it is a, an industry, or the people in there know that it's an industry that's held a very low esteem. So they have to work through other organizations uh, and other means to get, get, get laws passed or to block laws they don't like. Um, and they, they do that like that. They, 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 they go after wedge issues like that. They support candidates who are, uh, who are advocating things that uh, would appeal to socially, social, socially conservative Christians, for example. And that's how they, they get people to vote against their own self-interest. People are unwittingly voting against their own self-interest in many, many cases. Wendell, can you put the, the co-op that was announced the other day in context? I'm still confused about that issue. The co-op, yeah. A few days ago, you might have seen a story about the federal government providing some, some funding, I think in the form of a loan. Uh, I don't think they would be giving grants, but they, they, they are, uh, as part of the Affordable Care Act, providing money to organizations that are trying to start nonprofit cooperative health insurance plans around the country. And I was surprised, as I think maybe some of you were, that one of those 
that you're in Vermont. What's up with that? What I have learned is that uh, uh, some of the people behind that have been involved in providing uh, benefits through associations, uh, and, and they're wanting to make sure that as, as you go for the part you're doing, uh, that's in place to continue to have some, some means to keep that going for a while. Uh, I, that's the best I can, I'm told. Uh, it, it is probably something that uh, cannot and will not last uh, forever because if you go to single payer, you will have, uh, you, you'll have a system like what you're working for. And, and I would think that co-op would be absorbed into something like that. But I, I gather that it's a, it's a means of, of uh, trying to continue to be able to provide coverage through what they've been doing as you move forward with single payer. Much of the business community in the last couple of days has said, "Good idea, good idea, good idea." Exactly, and that's that's why they were doing it. We're going to be uh, maybe talking to people in the business community, but, but a lot of those folks uh, uh, are, are seeing this maybe as a, as an alternative, at least initially. Uh, and I, I would suspect that uh, uh, as the exchange when the exchange gets up and running, uh, that uh, it would like to be uh, offered uh, on the exchange for small businesses. Uh, so it'll be, I guess, to the Green Mountain Board as to whether or not that's going to happen or not. It, they can, until you get single payer, uh, they will be able to, to operate if they can really ramp up and be successful. Uh, and they may or may not be able to offer their products on the exchange. Uh, the Affordable Care Act allows insurance plans to operate outside the exchange too, but uh, the Green Mountain Board will certainly have to uh, pay close attention to that. So why don't we wrap it up? I know Wendell has a few more minutes after this event. I know he's probably has a lot of interviews to do. So thank you very much, Wendell. I, I found that just totally fascinating. So that's pretty much the end of the program. I'd like to thank everyone for coming. You all know how to get in touch with me. But in case you forget, you can pick up some of our information back there. And really, thanks to everyone for coming. Have a great day.